panel today includes Alberta Maziello, an assistant conductor of the Metropolitan who really needs no further introduction to our quiz fans. And we have two music critics, Martin Bernheimer, music critic of the Los Angeles Times, and Max de Schaunze, music critic of the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin. And a newcomer to our quiz, Glyn Ross, is general director of the Seattle Opera Association. Mr. Ross's Seattle company started in 1964, I'm told, with eight performances of four productions and then drew 6,000 people. And uh, five seasons later, in 1969, 200,000 people bought seats for 50 performances of 10 operas. Those are round figures, but uh, approximate. I That's right. Correct. Congratulations, <coughs> Mr. Thank Ross. You. Congratulations <coughs> to the people. They <laughs> <And> did it. <laughs> I'm told also that today's quiz is a, a reunion for Mr. Ross and Miss Maziello because they collaborated on an opera production 22 years ago. What was that occasion, oh dear, Mr. Ross? You make, make, we, we sound so ancient when you say 22 <laughs> years ago. If you can say that again. <laughs> um, let me tell you, though, uh, John Rosenfeld of the Dallas News at the time said that she was, in her common, she was the reincarnation of Geraldine Farrar. Isn't that true? Let me go and hide now. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that, don't you? Oh, I should say I do, and I remember also how much I enjoyed working with you. Oh, I remember dear. very well. <laughs> well, we have a question about today's opera from a listener in Berkeley, California, Joseph R. Hawkstim, uh, who writes us that in the first act of Der Rosenkavlia, while the Marshalin is holding her levee, or in plain English while she's having her hair done, she receives a very mixed bag of visitors who bring her a very mixed batch of people, of animals, of objects for inspection, hoping that she'll buy some and approve of others and so on. And the question is simply, how many of these can you remember? There are 10 in all, uh, well, Mr. The, Ross. The animals are a parrot, uh, dogs, which are supposed to be house broke, according to the script, uh, <laughs> a monkey, yeah. uh, Let's see, you want all the, all the objects that are being sold? Asking a great many for one person. Well, but all right, let me just take the animals then. I think that's all the animals. All right. Uh, Miss Maziello has a contribution. No, I just wanted to say the two dogs have been quite interesting of late in the Rosen Cavalier <laughs> performances that we've had. <laughs> uh, well, yes, I, I would say the hairdresser, the millionaire, the notary. Uh, let me see now. Who else? The, the head the cook. Yes, Mr. Bernheimer. There's an Italian tenor. Right. Yeah, he and the flute. <laughs> He's selling something. The flute what player. Does he, what does he produce? Oh, he produces yeah. a gorgeous Thank aria, especially today. <laughs> uh, yes. and there's also the Italian intriguers, uh, yes. Balzacchi and Anina, who are selling their services and not doing very well with the Marshallin herself. And they're also selling something else, uh, trying to sell something else oh, that dear. the Marshallin refuses. Spaghetti? No, no. no. Mr. Deschamps-Zay? Well, there's also a widow, I believe, who's trying to put across three orphans. Mm. Yes. Yes, well, but, in a but, sense, she's only selling those psychologically. Yes. She wants a contribution to their education. But the, what the uh, intriguers are offering is the black, uh, black newspaper, remember, this underground newspaper of court scandal. Mr. Ross? Yes, you said things. You see, you're all talking about services, but he mm -hmm. said things. So thus far, we've only come up with four of the mm -hmm. ten. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, dear. Oh, well, I'm not the things sure are... Think. Well, no, we got more. Rose, we got the hats and the... The hats and so on. But I think oh, you've yes, got the enough hats would be uh, five. of that. Uh, here's a uh, double-barreled question from DeKalb, Illinois. Robert H. Wilson writes us, in movie criticism, it's become a kind of a <coughs> cliche or a fad to speak of a good-bad movie, <coughs> meaning a film that the viewer doesn't <laughs> respect aesthetically, but he can enjoy lightheartedly and have a very pleasant evening. So the, quest, the first part of the question is, are there any operas that the panelists enjoy as good, bad operas? And then the second part, conversely, are there any operas that you know are great works, but that you personally just can't uh, warm to? Mr. Deschamps, eh? Well, I really am a soft touch for many so-called good, bad operas. Uh, I happen to like a great many operas that people turn their noses up at, such okay. as uh, Iris That's and funny. Thais. And uh, dare I say... No live was, was ever heard, Thais. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I hope not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would really put me back in the Ice Age. <laughs> <laughs> I take it and, all. Uh, and Luck May, though I hardly dare say it, I like that too, and André Chénier. All yeah. things that one is not supposed to be too wholehearted about. <laughs> and you do our wholehearted Oh, yes, about. I like them very Mr. much. Mr. Bernheimer. 
I think uh, La Gioconda is a perfectly dreadful opera. Uh, it's all about love and hate and murder and suicide and rape and riots, and this is all illustrated with lovely saccharine melodies and sweeping showpieces, and I adore it. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's a dreadful opera at all. I think it has a wonderful libretto by Boito, but you have to understand Italian very well, and then it, uh, it has really a great sweep. And so have some of the marvelous melodies, and it has a wonderful sense of theater. So what <laughs> more do you want? The words are fabulous. For example, the yes. words of the uh, Monumento Aria, marvelous. really, if one tries to really translate them, they are really quite fantastic. They are. Uh, even though perhaps the music is not really great. Mr. Deschamps, <laughs> you must agree. <laughs> <laughs> we'll agree However, with Boito, but we'll I, I would like to say, I would love to hear Francesca da Rimini, I would love to hear Lodoletta. Zandonai. Zandonai, yeah. yes. I will al also, one work which I heard, I heard, I sang in the chorus many, many years ago, God of forgive me, <laughs> which was called Giuliano by Zandonai, and I don't imagine that many people know this opera. It's a beautiful, beautiful work. Um, from my point of view, now of course I suppose that for a sophisticated audience perhaps it isn't the greatest music that you could ever hear, but I love to enjoy something and really enjoy it. I mean, I don't know, there is, something, there is something in the music that will make me feel something. That's all I can say, I don't know. And Miss Masiello, do you know Giulietta Romeo? Giulietta Romeo di Zandonai. Zandonai. No, I don't know. That, that. is wonderful, yeah, I, I bet it is. Yes. Well, after all this, we should get some Zandonai performed, Absolutely. Mr. Ross. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I think uh, Mr. Dijonse has touched really on it uh, because it really becomes a matter of the country and the spirit of that country. In other words, uh, uh, the Italians uh, have a different, let's say, mentality, or that isn't the word I want, a different, let's say, theatrical spirit. The, the Germans have another and the French have another. Now, uh, therefore, I think each one can have their own personal cup of tea, but I've heard many persons who, uh, let's say, were not of the uh, German, let's say, begeistered, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, Overwhelming conviction, maybe. Oh, all right. Uh, the sense of, of the deep spirit, so, and have spoken of, let's say, Ariadne obnoxious, or uh, oh, have that's said, <laughs> or who have said, or who have found that, uh, what do you call, uh, Frau is... Uh, uh, Langweilig, uh, that gets to, goes on and on oh, and on. Oh, I think maybe I'd better uh, <laughs> yes. massacre the entire repertoire. No, no, repertory. but meanwhile, one can, you know, one can go from country to country. I want to defend Strauss. I think that's terribly unfair, <laughs> especially Ariadne, which I think is a work of, of great delicacy and refinement and charm, and if the audience doesn't do its homework and doesn't understand what they're talking about, that's their problem. Uh, but doesn't uh, that go for everything? But this everything? goes for sure. this If we regard opera as drama with music, we've got to take the drama into account, not sit back and just take a bath in the beautiful sound. And if we're going to do that, I, we can't dismiss Ariadne, and probably not, not Frau Neschatten either. But I think it goes for everything. I mean, after all, for example, for an American audience, if the audience is to really enjoy a work, the audience must do a little homework on it, because otherwise uh, perhaps most of it will be completely lost. Oh. Well, if we go on in this, we'll soon be on the question of opera in English, and that's uh, something uh, for another no. day. Yeah, I've had several letters on... How about the other half of that question? Uh, the other half of the question, I think that has uh, fallen by the wayside. Uh, Mercy killing. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of letters on the uh, question of the last act of the Rosenkavalier, sort of a puzzler. This, the one with the earliest postmark, comes from Helen Fanta of Forest Hills, New York. The question is, in the last act of today's opera, who calls the marshal in? How come that such a great lady appears in a rather disreputable tavern? You remember Octavian surprised to see her, and Ox is surprised, and Sophie is surprised. How does she, uh, wh why does she make her appearance there all of a sudden? Miss Masiello. I, I, I don't know, but I, isn't there a, one of the servants of uh, Baron Ox who uh, goes and calls her? Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's ox not sends someone for her. Not Ox, no, no. no he goes on, on his own, as, as I can remember. Ms. I Yellow think. is right. Uh, it, it's uh, not what just one. It is the particular servant who happens to be his illegitimate son. Leopold. Leopold. Leopold, Leopold uh, sees his master in a yeah. terrible fix and gets the bright idea right. there's one right. person powerful enough to help his master, and so yeah. he rushes and gets the marshal in. Something always bothers me about that. Where was the marshal <laughs> at the time? She usually comes on looking as if she'd been at the coronation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's she true. Maybe she was. <laughs> she probably got her on the way home. Court ball. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Actually, this is one of the problems when Hoffman, Saal, and Strauss were working it out. Uh, but uh, it's, it's supposed to be made apparent in pantomime. It is one of the obscure points that most people don't get as they see the opera. Uh, here's a quite uh, different question, a desert island question, as we call them, from Gilbert Fuentes of Placentia, California. Uh, he asks you, what is your choice for the most poignant or most devastating last words an operatic character sings just before dying? Mr. Fuentes has sent us his choice, and I won't tell you until after you've all made your choices. Uh, I'll be surprised if you top his. Mr. Bernheim. Uh, my, my first choice, if I have to really answer the question, I think would be Manon, uh, who is a charming and brave coquette even to the end, and, and this very tragic death scene finally recounts the same words that she had said to de Gruyere in the first act when she introduced herself. She dies and says, et c'est l'histoire de Manon Lescaut, and that is the story of Manon Lescaut, and then very elegantly dies. It's lovely. <laughs> Uh, but if, if I have to mention my most poignant experience in the opera house in, in this, of this kind, I would have to mention a character who doesn't die, I'm sorry. It's the Marshallin herself, as she exits in the last act of Rosen mm -hmm. Cavalier. Uh, the funny now turns to her and says, San heute so die jungen Leute. That's the way young people are. And the Marshallin looks at Octavian and Sophie, and full of resignation and yet dignity and a certain amount of wistfulness says simply, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it makes me a little goose pimply every time, even, even at my grand old age. <laughs> With a seventh yeah. passage. <laughs> seventh passage. Marvelous last word. Marvelous. This <laughs> yeah, yeah. You sing it much better than I Out do. of tune, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Vaz. Oh, I think some of the most uh, poignant moments in all of our lives, are for the listeners as well, are those moments which are not literal, that is to say, when something else is being said, and I think that's the case also in Manon Lescaut, where she coyly says, at least while Manon Lescaut. But the one I think that uh, uh, is, can't help but be uh, moving is when Mimi simply says, al caldo, morire, and here it's warm, a dormire. Mean, don't mean, yeah. In the warm, it's so warm here to sleep, and it's so, uh, well, it just dwindles away. And somehow or other, you are in on the secret before anyone else there. And I think this becomes, as so many inarticulate moments, terribly articulate. Wonderfully expressive, yes. Miss Mazzello. I have one. If I may, I would like to go to the piano to do it, because I yes. think it is very, it's quite touching. Yes, of course, please do. <laughs> A lot of these aren't just the words, but the way the phrase And that is the, the last phrase that... Otello sings when he has already killed himself. <laughs> But to deviate from that, I would like to give an example of something that I May think I is very... You, Ms. Mazziello? Yes. Would you translate those last words and tell us just a what kiss. they are? I'm not sure everybody could a understand. A kiss, another kiss, another kiss. Of course, he's addressing Desdemona, naturally, whom he has just killed as well. And with a reminiscence from I, the love duet. <laughs> <laughs> I would like very much to think of something else. The addios in uh, operas when people are dying are really quite... Uh, often you see this, especially, for example, Leonora in Trovatore sings for 10 minutes, you know, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, and finally she says, Manrico, addio, io moro. <laughs> and on top of that, Manrico, oh madre, oh madre, addio, and he's dead too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very eloquent orchestra, I must say. Mr. Deschamps, do you have a... Wait. ...the overture to Don Giovanni, all like oh, our first of one? Course. Sure. Of course. In, in reverse. Now you recognize it, I'm sure. <laughs> all right. Uh, we have a third one of this curious collection from the standard repertory. Wow. 
<laughs> Mr. Bernheimer shuddered and put up his hand. <laughs> uh, Bernheimer? Triumphal scene of Aida? <laughs> Good for you. That's Mine. what it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I really I marvel. Really I love to say. Not very simply. At the moment, I thought I spotted something, but only for a <laughs> Well, I, I think you've proved that although you know your opera's forward, perhaps not, not entirely bad. backwards. <laughs> But I'm afraid that those chimes mean that we have to stop for today. So thank you very much for being with us. Alberta Maziello, Max, uh, Martin Bernheimer, Max de Chauenze, and Gwyn Ross. This is Edward Downs inviting you to another session of Texaco's Opera Quiz next week during the second intermission of Puccini's Madame Butterfly.